Welcome to the Contrarian Investor Podcast. We give voice to those who challenge a prevailing sentiment in global financial markets. This podcast is for informational purposes only. Nothing on this podcast should be taken as investment advice. Guests were not compensated for their appearance, nor do they supply payment in order to appear. Individuals on this podcast may hold positions in the securities that are discussed. Listeners are urged to educate themselves and make their own decisions. This podcast episode may have ads and the occasional announcement. To listen without ads or announcements and take advantage of a host of other benefits, consider becoming a premium subscriber. Visit the website contrarian.supercast.tech. That's T-E-C-H for more information. Now, here's your host, Mr. Nathaniel E. Baker. Here with Dana Samuelson, the president of the American Gold Exchange. Dana, thank you so much for joining the Contrarian Investor Podcast today. And it's my pleasure to be here with you. Thanks for having me. Thanks for coming on. I'm very excited about our conversation. We are going to talk about gold, duh, and all things precious metal. To kick things off here, we're looking at a, we've been looking at a bit of a stealth rally for gold. And you haven't heard all that much about it. And I'm wondering if there is potentially even more upside in light of all of the factors that we have with geopolitical uncertainty, with interest rates coming down and other things and what that means for gold. So yeah, curious curious there because like I said, we are right near all time highs. And so you would think that there's not much upside left usually in times like these, but that may be the wrong assumption. I do believe it is. And if you give me a second, I can go through the drivers that are normally driving the gold market. So number one, you know, gold has been tracking our debt higher over the last 20 years. In 1995, we had $5 trillion in debt. It took us 200 years to get that high in debt. In 2004, our debt was $7 trillion. In 2014, it was $17 trillion, So it had doubled, more than doubled a little bit. And in the last 10 years, 2014 to 2024, it's doubled again to $35 trillion. So you've got to ask yourself, are we going to be at $68 trillion in debt in another 10 years? Which is, you know, close to that's a possibility. And the government's already said that Medicare and Social Security will be insolvent in 2035 or 2036. So that's their own calculation. So number one, we're following the debt higher in the bigger picture. In the shorter picture, we're in an inflationary environment. When inflation's good for precious metals and that, it's the debasement of the purchasing power of the currency that helps drive people into precious metals. So that's creating some demand because gold tends to hold its purchasing power over time. We've got two geopolitical conflicts. The war in the Ukraine helped to boost gold. And now we've got the Israel and Iranian conflict through uh, surrogates, Hezbollah and Hamas. And that hasn't eased. In fact, uh, you know the, the the previous peak in gold of twenty four thirty eight in April coincided perfectly with Iran and Israel taking direct shots at each other for the first time ever. So the one thing that's missing from the equation right now is an interest rate reduction. We are seeing yields on the ten year treasuries and the and the other treasuries coming down, which is the market gaming that the Fed will cut rates and. It's increasingly likely that the Fed will cut rates in September. Uh, and I looked at the last two times we went into a Fed rate reduction cycle in 2007. Uh, it was a different market. The Fed started at five and a quarter percent. They got down to about uh, two and a half percent and gold jumped 50 percent in price from 660 to 990. Mm. And that's before the great financial crisis erupted and gold eventually went to 1900. In this cycle, it's more reminiscent of what happened in 2019 when the federal funds rate was at two and a half percent is as high as it got and 10-year treasury yields got to three and a half percent well then treasury yields were falling before the fed cut rates gold was 1330 it couldn't get over a 1375 high for six years but then when the fed did cut rates gold jumped 200 bucks to 1550 in a couple of months And I think we're in a similar window right now where the market's waiting for that Fed to actually take a move. And when they do, that could give gold 10, 15 percent tailwind like it did in 2019, which would put gold into the 2600 to 2700 range from 
you know, 2400, 2450, which is where we're at today. Hmm. I do think that gold can still go higher, but there is really no fear in the U.S. market creating demand. Normally, we would get people chasing this market with the gold price running, but we're actually in my physical, I'm a physical dealer. We're seeing, and across the industry, not only myself, but we're seeing sellers and a bit more selling than buying. So we have a bit of a disequilibrium in product flow right now, which is pushing premiums on physical products to cyclical lows, which is unusual. So from a contrarian bet, the rest of the world's buying gold, but the U.S. is not. And there's one other factor that I need to bring up if uh, I can, and that's central bank buying of gold. You've heard about the de-dollarization movement because of the weaponization of the dollar against Russia following the Russian invasion of the Ukraine. Well, from 1950 to 2010, for all that period of time, central banks for almost every year were net sellers of gold. Since 2010 to 2021, central banks have been net buyers of gold following the great financial crisis and the explosion of global debt. Now, these are the guys that have the printing presses and have turned them on without any realistic restraint on them. So they've created new currency out of thin air. Well, these are the guys that have been buying 500 tons of gold annually a year for the last 11 years until we weaponize the dollar. The last two years, they've doubled that gold buying to 1,000 tons or more a year because they can't get out of the dollar as fast as they'd like, but they need to have an asset that can't be sanctioned, like a U.S. Treasury or accounts in our banks. So they're buying gold at a record rate, which is also a material change of behavior, doubling their gold buying. And I think it's making a difference at the margin and will help to buoy the gold price higher even further over time. It's not that they want to get out of the dollar. They do, but they can't. It's they need to have an asset that can't be sanctioned and gold is what they're going to. Yeah. Wow. So you've always, you've been doing this for a long time. Um, <laughs> can you remember any other time when the forces were this all this much aligned in favor of gold? Uh, no. I'm trying to think just, yeah. Okay. No. Well, simple answer. You know, for most, I've been doing this since 1980, watching these markets and I've been very actively involved since I started American Gold Exchange 26 years ago. I watched the gold price all day, every day. Usually we get one or two of these things at the same time. Yeah. Now we've got all four coming together, the four big ones. And the only one that's really absent is a reduction in the federal funds rate right now. And that'll give gold a tailwind. So it's unusual to have four or five major drivers all hitting the market at the same place at the same time time, which is why I am more bullish on gold than I ever have been before. If you'd asked me in 2019 when gold was still 1350, you know, when are we going to see $3,000 gold? I would have said, no, that's a long ways away. Five years later, our debt's up another 50%. Gold's 2450. When are we going to see $3,000 gold? Probably two years from now. Okay. I was going to ask you how, how, I mean, that sounds almost kind of less bullish than I was anticipating because it's 2,500 now, just about. We've already had a big run this year though. Gold's gone right. from 2050 to 2450, which is a 20% gain almost. Right. And that's a pretty big gain to start with, let alone another 10%, which was what I think the Fed will give us. Okay. You know, absent a crisis, you know, I think 3,000 is actually a little conservative. Yeah. If the, if the government has to go to economic stimulus, like QE5 or 6, you know, some call what happened during uh, the COVID QE5 or QE4, um, if they go to economic stimulus, you know, I'm being very conservative, I think, in my what could happen to gold. Mm -hmm. I, I guess the, the one thing is that, uh, you know, going, going back to 2008, if you have a major crisis, it was interesting to see that back then gold, I mean, it did better than a lot of assets like stocks. But it still sold off from 08 to 09. Well, we had a we had a liquidity event. Right. Over a couple of months when everything was getting sold. That's right. Gold got sold from 975 down to 775, but it rebounded back up. It was a three-month shaped V. And I I call that, you know, it's kind of like throwing the baby out with the bathwater. Right. <laughs> right. Now we had a similar sell-off event in March of 2020 when COVID hit. Right. Remember when oil went negative for a day, right? We had the same kind of a sell-off in gold 
and it lasted three days. Right. I mean, we had a, the most wicked, violent V-shaped move I've ever seen. And everybody that realized what was really happening got back in as fast as they could when they saw hey, this is really how the rubber meets the road. Mm. So, you know, if we have a, an economic slowdown, a real one, we could have another selling event. Uh, and gold is tracking a little bit with the stock market's health or lack of health right now. Um, you know, stocks had a big day up a couple of days ago and gold re re rallied in response. Now stocks are selling off a bit and gold selling off a bit. But gold's still re range bound. And I think the key here for gold is we got a real hard bottom at 2300 and we're testing a new all time high at 2450, 2470 right now. And things are quiet. There's not much going on. And we're testing a new all time high. That's the market gaming the potential for the Fed to cut rates. Right. Do you think that might be priced in already? Yeah, there's 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 a difference between pricing it in and then the reality of the cuts actually coming because the cut isn't so much a quarter point rate cut. It won't do that much, but it's the mentality of the going the other way, I think, that has a much more a resonating factor in the markets. What do you say to people who say that there's no tangible use for gold, that you just dig it up in one place and bury it in another place? <laughs> well, they got a point. <laughs> it's just a dead rock, but it's the it's the world's most valuable rock for trust, uh, intrinsic value, liquidity worldwide. I mean, when central bankers are buying it at a record clip, that tells you it's got more utility than just a dead rock. It doesn't produce a yield, and gold typically doesn't do well when interest rates are higher. But with inflation higher as well, the yield today could be considered negative depending upon how you measure uh, in inflation relative to the you know what you can get in a CD a five percent or four and a half percent. You know, do you really think inflation is really three percent? You know, groceries cost twenty five percent more than they did a couple of years ago. I, I like to have a steak. I'm in Austin, Texas. You know, that steak. A good one used to cost me 20 bucks. Now it costs me 32. Disinflation might get it back to 29. It's not going back to 20 anytime soon. We, we already got the haircut, right? And gold has responded. So gold has a use beyond just being, you know, a rock. <laughs> mm -hmm. you, you and your firm, you, you use it for other things. Like you sell the uh, gold bars. I know that a lot of investors collect actual physical gold bars. And other things like that. I had a guy on the show who sold these things called gold notes or something. They were the actual physical currency, like very thin. Gold actual... backs. Yeah, that was it. Yeah. 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 The gold Jerome, I think is his name. He had yeah. Gold. Then they have a tiny fraction of gold in the, in the plastic. Right. Exactly. Currency. Yeah. yeah. I think those are a novelty item, but they are getting traction as real tradable currency in several States and then in the Midwest and the West, uh, where people tend to be more independent. I hear they're doing pretty well at, you know, at like flea markets and gun shows and private right. events you know, holding their value. People like those because it's not the dollar. But to me, that's more of a novelty item. You know, I'm a physical precious metals dealer and I'm also a vintage US gold coin expert. The coins that were made 1933 and earlier to be made as currency that still survive the ravages of time today. So um, I deal in the physical product and I like the coins, which are really just round bars that the U.S. Mint makes, the Canadian Mint makes, Austrian Mint, British Royal Mint, Australian Mint. These are the big five mints around the world. It's vanilla, chocolate, strawberry, if they were ice cream flavors. Uh, plain bars, I think, could have a sellability problem in the future if the public owns them and wants to sell them like deal to dealers like me because... We have a modest but growing problem with Chinese counterfeits. Oh, boy. And the Chinese can counterfeit the bars more readily and pass tungsten plated, uh, tungsten core gold plated bars more easily because the design on them is plain. All of the mints around the world have added anti counterfeiting, minute design elements into the picture on the coin that's stamped into the coin. To make it easier for dealers like me to know, hey, these are legitimate mint products, where a bar is with a simple design can be more readily counterfeited and passed. So I think if you want to have a product that's easy to buy and easy, more importantly, easy to sell in the future, you should buy sovereign minted one ounce gold coins 
in lieu of refinery made gold bars for investment in this market. Interesting. And so they, they these come in like one ounce or however many ounces denominations, these things? Yeah, the, the mints make one ounce coins. Like I said, they're just really round bars. Yeah, uh, There are fractionals to half, quarter and tenths, but they cost a little bit more for the same ounce for manufacturing uh, production. It's, you know, two, two, four, ten times the same amount of time and effort for the same ounce. So you pay a little higher rate. Bars tend to be a little cheaper, but sometimes the cheaper isn't the best because you'll get a lower bid. And I think we'll we'll go to wanting to maybe melt some of these things before we actually pay people uh-huh. for them, which is where I talk about a sellability issue. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Make yeah. sure it's real gold. <laughs> what would it be? That, so they just put gold foil over it or, or over iron or what? How does that work? No, they take tungsten. Oh. Which has almost the same density of gold and they plate it with a layer of gold. So wow. there, you, know, you might have, you know, one ounce bar might have a quarter ounce of gold in it around a tungsten core. And the size is a little bit off. Because to get the weight right, right, tungsten is just a little bit less dense, so it takes a little bit more volume. But the way these bars are packaged, they tend to come in packages about the size of a baseball card with a cardboard insert that the bar is sitting in with a plastic uh, uh, shell around it. And we can't take them out without kind of making them less desirable to the next guy. So the packaging is a problem. You know, the coins that the mints make come in tubes. We can take them out. Mm-hmm. We can... They actually ring. If you touch one against another, they'll make a a very uh, uh, perfect pitch noise. Mm. I'm used to hearing it mm. <laughs> all the time. So uh, there's and we have we have testing machines like X-ray guns or density measuring machines that we use to make sure the product that we have is real. It's important. <laughs> cool. Yeah. All right. Dana Samuelson, I want to take a short break and then come back and ask you some more about gold and precious metals and some other stuff. But we will first take a short break. Like I said, unless you are a premium subscriber, in which case you will not get the break. Do not touch the dial. We'll be right back. In fact, we already are. To become a premium subscriber, visit the website contrarianpod.substack.com and sign up. We hope you're enjoying this episode of the Contrarian Investor Podcast, where we give voice to those who challenge a prevailing narrative in global financial markets. Consider becoming a premium subscriber. For $9 a month or less, premium subscribers receive a number of benefits. Podcasts are posted immediately after they're recorded. Transcripts are made available within 24 hours. Premium subscribers get direct access to the host And of course, there are no ads or interruptions. Visit contrarian.supercast.tech for more information. By the way, you don't need the .tech suffix to get to that website. .com will do the trick. And we also have a Substack where you can sign up for the same prices, same benefits, same details, contrarianpod.substack.com. So if you already have a Substack account and use it or have the app and use that, that's probably the best way to go. So contrarian.supercast.com or contrarianpod.substack.com. Whole bunch of benefits, including, of course, getting this episode up to a week early without ads or annoying announcements. And you also get the Daily Contrarian briefing and podcast that is released every market day morning at 7 a.m. This is a contrarian take on the events of the day ahead and what is likely to move markets, such as economic data releases, earnings, and other things. It is really good, and that is completely unbiased, of course. So check that out, contrarianpod.substack.com or contrarian.supercast.tech. Now on with the show. Welcome back, everybody. Here with Dana Samuelson joining us from Austin, Texas. Dana, how hot is it down there right now? Oh, it's hot. It's yeah. Texas in July, so we're going to be about 105 today, but we're all used to it, so it's okay. Yeah, well, you got us beat up here in New York. We're in the 90s. Actually, today's cooler, 80s. Anyway, 
This is the segment of the show where I ask the guest to tell us a little bit more about him or herself and how he or she came to investing in the first place. In your case, I guess, uh, wondering how you got into gold and how you came to start the American Gold Exchange. So take us away and, and uh, fill us in. Well, I'll try and give you the short version. So I got out of college in 1980 with a German degree. Uh, I was going to be a psychology major, and I decided to not do that. I didn't want to do that. And so the only way I could get out of on schedule with my class was to roll into German, which I, it's just what happened. So I was unhirable like any college graduate was in 2009. We had a tough economy in 1980, just like we did in 2009. Interest rates were sky high. Inflation was sky high. We had hostages stuck in Iran. Uh, and I ended up getting a job working in a vault for a company that uh, was handling a lot of physical silver in Houston, Texas, because I could be trusted. My brother worked for that company and he got me a job working in their vault counting, shipping, and weighing. So I did that for two years, and I ended up getting a lucky break going to work for Jim Blanchard in 1983. Jim is the guy that's most responsible for the private re-legalization of gold ownership in 1974, following Nixon taking the dollar off of the gold standard in 1971. And that's a whole other history lesson that we'll save for another time. So I ended up going to work for Jim, who had the biggest mail order coin company in the in the country at the time. And I was taught to be a coin appraiser, a vintage coin appraiser. When the buyer would go to coin shows to buy vintage coins, I would go up to the trading desk and be a substitute trader. Well, I ended up becoming trader, senior trader, and I spent 50 million bucks of Jim's money with the industry in the 80s. And I got to know all of the major players which is really my formative time. And Jim was a dynamo. Uh, he ended up selling his company to General Electric. I went back to work for him again in 1993 when his non-compete expired and he started a new company. So I helped him start a new company. And I did that for two and a half years. And you know, the old expression, sometimes you, can, you can't go back home. Mm -hmm. Well, it was a little more, it was a little different the second time around. So I ended up moving to Austin and starting American Gold Exchange in 1998. Based on what I learned from formal, you know, my my ten years on two different tours of duty with Jim, and I got into the market at the bottom of the market. Gold had hit two hundred and fifty dollars in nineteen ninety nine an ounce, and now it's you know of course almost ten times that value. Mm. So I'm also a past president of the Professional Numismatist Guild, which is the leading organization of rare coin dealers in the country. And it was under my presidency in 2016 that I conceived of and helped to establish the industry anti-counterfeiting task force, hmm. because that's when it came to our attention as an industry that the Chinese were, were putting spurious merchandise into the U.S. marketplace, primarily through, yeah, through auctions and private sales. So I helped to create the task force that today works with Homeland Security and Secret Service to interdict shipments of spurious metals and they've already intercepted you know over 100 million bucks worth of product street value mm. but then, you know the real value is obviously a fraction of that mm. and i've also become a government witness an expert government witness in uh two allegedly predatory pricing precious metals dealers suits lawsuits that the cftc has filed against a couple of companies um we're an unregulated business anybody can be a precious metals dealer so we do have opportunists that come into our space so I'm trying to help the industry in that regard as well. So I'm trying to give back to the industry that is my livelihood by helping to protect the integrity of the product and also to help the, the customers out there who want to buy the product in the in the ways that a humble precious metals dealer from Austin, Texas can do. <laughs> yeah. And what does American Gold Exchange do exactly? Well, we buy and sell physical product. We buy and sell the, the product that's been made by the various mints over the years uh, in the modern era time, primarily since the 70s, uh, the South Africans started making gold Krugerrands in 1967, the Canadian mint Maple Leafs in 1979, the Chinese mint 1982, U.S. mint 1986, Austrian mint 1999. So we buy and sell the physical products that these countries make, uh, both uh, bullion items and some collectible items that they do sell as well. And again, I'm a vintage coin expert. I, I'm an appraiser of vintage coins, usually gold and silver. 
going back that the U.S. Mint's made from 1795 all the way to 1933. Hmm. I'm a nerd. I'm just a nerd. Was 1933 the last time they had any kind of actual precious metals in the current, in the coins? Yes, yes. So Franklin Roosevelt became president in 1932 during the election at the end of 1932, and he was inaugurated in early 1933. That was during the depths of the Depression following the Wall Street crash of 1929, and he wanted to print more money than was printable in gold coins at the time to stimulate the system then. So the U.S. confiscated gold in 1933 from the public when it was valued internationally for 70 years at $20.57 an ounce. And then two years later, the national international market revalued it at $35 an ounce. It's one of the biggest confiscations and wealth transfers in history as the U.S. was then dependent upon paper money. Then World War II came around, and that was the end of gold as gold currency in the world. Every other country followed suit, either what's after the price was re- re- revised higher, which made the currency obsolete, or uh, once the ravages of World War II were over. That's when the dollar became the world's reserve currency backed by gold, and that lasted until you know 1971. It, it didn't even make it 26 years before we had to take the U.S. off the gold standard because we were printing more money than we had gold at the time. Right. To back it. Yeah. Yeah. Now, so how about silver? Was silver in any coins? Yeah, we've had silver coins all the way from 1793 all the way till 1964. That's when it was. was, And the quarters, right? Quarters and dimes, 1964 and and earlier have have real silver. Yeah, they're 90% silver by weight. So here's an interesting little tidbit. This is a 1964 silver quarter. I don't know if right. you, people can see it. The edge is white. It's not copper nickel like the coins we have in our pocket today. In 1964, this quarter buy a gallon of gas. Hmm. The quarter huh. they made the next year that's copper nickel, 25 cents, 1965, buy a gallon of gas. Now, how much will that quarter buy you in gas today that you have in your mm-hmm. pocket? Yeah, you know, one sixtieth of a gallon. About. Yeah, less than a tenth, you know, 15th, mm-hmm. 20th, whatever it is. This silver quarter by a gallon and a half today. That shows you how silver holds its purchasing power over time, too. So uh, we took the silver out of our currency in 1964. Other countries around the world had silver coins going into the 70s. But when the silver price rocketed higher in the in the late 70s, like gold did, uh, that made currency in silver obsolete as money. And that ended silver in the world as currency. Okay. What about any other precious metals that are, can still be found in coins? No, not in circulating coins. I mean, we also deal in a little bit in platinum and palladium, which are the other two of the four traditional precious metals, gold, silver, platinum, and palladium. They're more industrial related, primarily in catalytic converters for gasoline and diesel engines, palladium for gasoline and platinum for diesel. How often do you come across the gold? And it's quarters too, right? No, not just, uh, I'm sorry, it's, it's um, dimes too, not just nickels, but quarters, right? Yeah, silver and, and dimes, nickels? quarters, no, not nickels, quarters, okay. dimes, and half dollars. Okay. Up to and including 1964 right. are silver. Now yeah. we trade them by the dollar of face value because a, a dollar has 0.715 ounces in it. So if it's two half dollars, four quarters, or 10 dimes, that equals 0.715 ounces. We don't trade it by the coin because it's too it's too hard yeah, to yeah. calculate. <laughs> Are those still out there? Do you go through your change? I mean, who even pays with cash anymore? But if and um, yeah, do you still find those? No, no. If, if once in a while in a blue moon something will pop up in, in currency or somebody will deposit some at the bank and the banker doesn't know what to do with it. But the, the 70s and the early 80s drove most of the silver coins that were out there out of circulation and into you know, people's private hands to hoard yeah, them. We yeah. call that Gresham's Law, bad money drives good money out of circulation. And that's exactly what happened to the silver coins. Yeah. And it, it, other countries, we have an international audience here. Are there other countries that have used precious metals, uh, maybe more recently than the U.S., that might still have them floating around? That you can think of off the top of your head? Well, I said central, not as money, not as, you know, money. No, I know, but yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, money and currency are two different things. Money has value. Currency is a method of uh, transaction, tradable 
you know, an entity that's tradable. So paper dollars are currency, but they're not money. They have no intrinsic value. Okay. Now, I think it goes back to central banks, you know, buying gold at a record clip the last two years. They're they're buying it to have ounces on the shelf. There's talk of a currency that the BRICS nations and the wannabe BRICS applicants will create a currency that is potentially partially gold backed or other commodity backed. Uh, they've even named it the unit. Uh, whether it becomes something or anything over time, we'll see. You know, it took 20 years for the euro to be born after conception. You know, in the 70s is when the euro was conceived of, but it wasn't really created until 1999 in practicality, unifying, you know, 17 nations that were independent in Europe. So the BRICS are trying to do the same thing. They're talking about doing it with a partially backed gold currency. We'll, we'll, we'll have to see how it all plays out. You know, that's the dollar's not going anywhere soon. It's entrenched in the world's financial systems. And the reason that central bankers are buying gold at record rates is because they, they need to have an asset that is, you know, not confiscatable and not sanctionable. Um, whether this is part of a drive towards a partially gold backed currency on the eastern side of the world, we'll just have to see. Gosh, yeah, that's so interesting. Okay, cool. So what would you recommend for people as as far as an actual store of value as buying if they wanted to buy the physical, you know, they don't want to buy one of these ETFs or whatever. You think you say the mint coins are are probably the best in terms of cost and and also storage ability and all these things. Yeah, for for recognized sellability, the US mint made gold and silver eagles are the first choice. Uh, Canadian minted one ounce gold and silver maple leaves or Austrian minted one ounce gold and silver philharmonics are the second choice. We've gone through periods of uh, extreme demand over the last few years because of the way the market went following COVID. You know, we had a big explosion in gold demand. The mint, and the point is, the US mint can't always keep up with demand. And sometimes the premiums that uh, the market will bear for their products when there's not enough of them to go around go higher than they mm. should. And you don't always recapture that when it's your turn to sell them. That's right. So when that happens, then we say, yeah, go to the Canadian or the Austrian products. But otherwise, if the product, if the premiums are the same or close, very close, buy the U.S. products first because they're the easiest to sell. Hmm. But they're all easy to sell. Yeah. Are there any household items that, that contain gold or other precious metals that um, if or some of the more enterprising listeners wanted to start taking things apart? <laughs> well, there's grandma's sterling silverware. Number of course. One. You know, gold is found in electronics, but it's usually really, really small yeah. amounts. Uh, silver is used in um, hydrogen fuel cells. Yeah, I don't have any of those. Solar panels, right? But getting some of the silver out uh, of those things is tough. I can tell you that uh, one of my friends lives in California, and he had the same guy try to steal his catalytic converter off of his car. Oh, yeah, that's been a big thing. Yeah, that's <laughs> because been here the catalytic too. converters have platinum and palladium in them. Right. <laughs> and the same guy tried to steal the con his, his muffler twice. <laughs> oh, jeez. <laughs> wow, insane, insane. All right. Yeah. What, what's your view on digital currencies and, and, and Bitcoin? Well, uh, I didn't get Bitcoin when it first came out, and I had an opportunity to buy it when it was $20, and uh, it was huh. a big mistake on my part because I didn't understand it. I understand it now. Uh, you know what? Bitcoin can really do that precious metals can't is move money over borders right. very effectively because gold is like a currency and that there are value controls on how much you can move in and out of the country. But Bitcoin gives you that opportunity, and I think that that's one of its primary and maybe it's really only utility factors, right? But there's a place for it. And there's a place for other digital currencies as well. I don't know if there's a place for a thousand of them, yeah. but I think there's a place for five or 10. Um, but I stay out of that market. I'm a humble precious metals and vintage coin dealer. Um, digital currency, we will be going to digital currencies. That's going to happen. But it's not much different when you think about it than you know credit card that we have. Yeah, I was going to say, aren't we already there? Like, yeah. In effect, we are. Now, what digital currencies will give us will have less paper to trade, right? Um, I do think that the potential for the government to get into our business about mm. following how we spend money, if we spend it digitally, is potentially a problem because if you're not politically correct, look what we did to Russia. Now, what happens if 
you know, they decide to go after citizens who are spending money where they don't want them to be. I think that that's potentially a problem, but I love America. I love our country. I'm a patriot. I, I have a great life and I never would have had the opportunities that I've had here to, to create and build a business and generate some wealth that I, I, I never would have had this opportunity anywhere else. Mm. Digital currencies are coming, you know, how they are used, I think will be like credit cards and how we pay our bills and how we get paid. Uh, what happens beyond that, though, I, I do I do have some concerns about that. Okay, like what? Well, oh, you tracking, mean what you just talked about, yeah. Yeah, just tracking. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, if we ever need to stimulate the economy, they could just put money right in your mm -hmm. account. You know, they, you don't even have to get a check mail to you. So that, that can change things. And that, uh, who knows? what unintended consequences might come mm. from digital currencies. You really don't know until you know, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Any thoughts on gold miners and stocks like that? Uh, I I don't follow the mining companies. Uh, there's a lot of them out there. Uh, one of my friends who came up with me at Blanchard and Company in the 80s with Jim Blanchard is a guy named Brian London, uh, he's out of New Orleans. He has a newsletter called the Gold Newsletter, which uh, evaluates mining companies, which I think if people are interested in mining stocks, uh, that's a good place to, to look for a resource of, of um, information. Uh, there's another gentleman by the name of Rick Rule, who is probably the leading guru of the whole mining stock industry as an analyst. Uh, I just did a conference with with his uh, people called the Rule Symposium in Boca Raton, Florida, and he had some of the top mining companies in the world there. But I'm highly correlated to gold now in my business, so I just stick with what I'm doing, let alone uh, getting into the speculative mining business. So yeah. how good is the deposit? How good is the company that's managing the business? Is there geopolitical risk? You no. Know, Higher energy costs have hurt the mining companies because it's cost more to get the same gold out of the ground, even the gold, the gold's mm -hmm. more valuable. So there's a lot of variables that go yeah. into that. That's a little bit above my pay grade. <laughs> sure, sure. Fair enough. Any thoughts on how much, uh, what allocation to gold or to precious metals somebody should have in their portfolio? Yeah, I, I do. I think that um, uh, the average person ought to have five to 10% of net assets in precious metals, primarily gold and silver, uh, as a hedge against uh, financial uncertainty. Gold proved its uh, its worth worth its weight in gold during the great financial hmm. crisis, and again when COVID hit, and it's doing so again now in this in inflationary environment. You know, they say the the sweet spot six to eight percent because it gives you enough without taking opportunity from other sectors. Yeah. So you should have some, but not too much. And it does yeah. make a lot of sense. And a lot of people around the world do that religiously. We, we've we never had a gold culture in our current country because we've never had war on our shores right. and we never had our currency fail. If you've had those things happen in your life where you live around the world, you would like to have some gold. Yeah. Oh, yes, yes, yes. All right. Uh, Dana Samuelson, thank you again for joining the Contrarian Investor podcast today. Very interesting conversation. Maybe in closing, you tell our tell our listeners how they find out more about you, more about, about the American Gold Exchange, and I'll put all that in the show notes as well. Great. Thank you. So our website is amergold.com. Our email address is info, I-N-F-O, at A-M-E-R gold.com. We have a very simple to navigate website that is uh, has live, transparent pricing, very competitive, by the way. Uh, it's also uh, got some good basic information if you're getting started. Then we do have a getting started guide. We can email people, which is a 12-page PDF that explains the physical products very simply so you can understand. And if you want to follow me when I comment on economic information, I, we have a YouTube channel, American Gold Exchange, and I'm increasingly trying to communicate to my clients and prospects via YouTube because it's just easier to tape a 10, 15 minute video when something's happening versus putting out something in writing via email. Very cool. All right. I will definitely subscribe to that. American Gold Exchange on YouTube. Any other social medias? Uh, yeah, we have a LinkedIn presence. Mm -hmm. uh, we're on Twitter. Uh, or X uh, as Dana Samuelson 99. That's my. Well, that was you. Okay. Yeah. That's my X account. 
Uh, and then uh, LinkedIn. I have a LinkedIn presence both personally and professionally. So yeah. anybody that wants to follow me can go to LinkedIn and follow either my company or, or me personally. Awesome. Very good. All right, Dana, thank you for coming on. Thank you all for listening. And we'll be back here again in a couple of weeks. Speak then. Bye. Thank you for listening to the Contrarian Investor Podcast. We hope you enjoyed this episode. To subscribe to this podcast, simply open your favorite podcast software and search for Contrarian Investor. Follow us on social media by searching for Contrarian Investor on Twitter and Instagram. Send us your thoughts on feedback at contrarianpod.com. We look forward to speaking to you again next time.